director at Chawton House, where I look after academic programming. So Chawton House has long been a centre for the study of 18th and 19th century women writers, and the library here houses a remarkable collection of works by and about women. From 2007, for 10 years, Chawton House offered a really competitive visiting fellowship programme in partnership with the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Southampton. And in doing so, it built up a community of scholars across the globe and supported world-class research. Following a five-year suspension due to changes in funding, this year, in August, we welcomed our first cohort on our new visiting fellowship programme, which is aimed specifically at doctoral and early career researchers. And this was made possible by a generous donation from the Ardeola Charitable Trust. So the three fellows lived on site at Chawton House for four weeks and they undertook their research in the reading rooms. I'm delighted to be able to share some of their work with you in this video and I hope that it gives you a flavour of some of the possibilities for research here in the reading rooms. So my name is Charlotte Googe and um, I've just finished the first year of my PhD at University of Kent. The uh, focus of my project is um, conceptions and depictions of female corpulence in the 18th and early 19th century. Okay, so could you say a little bit about what corpulence actually is? Of course. So corpulence uh, is um, in the 18th century uh, specifically treated as a disease um, and also it's um, during the 18th century that it becomes used um, in popular vernacular. So to paraphrase, the entry for corpulency in Johnson's dictionary um, is when you get the concept of uh, a bulky body and with the emphasis placed on the fat as being excessive in the body. So your research focuses specifically on female corpulence and is there a particular reason for that? Mm -hmm. So there is. Um, so corpulency was understood to affect both men and women. Um, however, up until now, um, there's a significant scholarly gap. All the focus is sort of placed on the corpulent man. And that's really a huge oversight because the idea of corpulency and all the things tied up to it, themes of temperance, which ties in with politeness, um, all contribute and tie into... Um, the formulation of femininity in the period and without that I mean yeah you're overlooking a whole area mm -hmm. um so yes it sort of builds in the medical discourse of late 17th early 18th century and then really comes through by the early 19th century mm -hmm. um it becomes to be corpulent is a very loaded term mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and that is very that's what I'm here to investigate <laughs> so thinking then about um body shape and body size that mm -hmm. becomes a way of thinking about much bigger issues of mm -hmm. identity so what becomes associated with corpulency is not just necessarily what is someone's physical size. What corpulence um, is sort of used as an indicator of is anything from um, sexual appetite, not even excessive, just the fact that a woman has sexual appetite. Um, you have um, how does it reflect on her views or behaviour in relation to maternity, um, seen as the sort of selfishness which I'll return to. Um, often you have women uh, of the mercantile class being depicted as corpulent to sort of indicate their um, upstart sort of status or um, desire for social mobility moving sort of above their station. Mm. Um, and then also um, something that I'm going to return to later, um, this idea of othering, the fat woman is othered by her corpulence mm -hmm. and what that says about national identity. Okay, so what were you focusing on specifically while you were here? So the great thing about Chawton, um, having a focused collection on not only women's writing, but writing about women is really useful for the interdisciplinary nature of my project and um, because the library boasts not only um, uh, letters and journals and novels, but you've got medical treatises, um, you've got... Um, illustrated works and all of this really helps me get a bigger sense of how is the fat woman being or corpulent woman being understood in this period. So the medical treatises that I consulted in the Chawton collection mm. contributed to an existing idea I built up of um, the anxiety over how did corpulence impact um, a, a woman's ability to conceive and also um, if pregnant to see it to a full term. The text I looked at specifically were um, Buchan's Advice to Mother's Medical Treatise. So Buchan was a prolific physician of the early 19th century. What is interesting about his work, he sort of perpetuates the idea 
that pregnancy is the most important period of a woman's life. What he adds to that is essentially if you're leaner, you're reduced in appearance whilst pregnant, that's a good sign because it means all nutrients are going to the fetus. However, if you have grown fat, corpulent or remained corpulent during your pregnancy, it means you're likely to have a small child because you're stealing all the nutrient for yourself <laughs> rather than... <laughs> but it, is, it, it plays into this anxiety. Essentially, um, the ongoing theme in medical discourse is the inherent selfishness of the corpulent mother or mother-to-be mm. mm. uh, because this idea that her fatness signifies that it's not going to the fetus. Another text that I consulted for a more popular culture, literary culture perspective was um, Sarah Pearson's The Medallion, mm -hmm. uh, 1794, which um, is a text uh, that I was really fighting to find in America and bizarrely was available in Shorten. So um, The Medallion is yeah. a great text to um, look at in terms of female corpulence. The Medallion is what's called an it narrative, mm -hmm. which is kind of self-explanatory, but the narrative is told from an inanimate object's perspective, mm -hmm. hence it. It sort of takes place over 20 years in the lead up to the French Revolution. Um, and it focuses on when the medallion's in the possession of a character called Lady Viola Falkland. So she's of the like upper class. And what it looks at is the trials and tribulations of her friends and family. Um, they have a vested interest in France, but um, and mostly live in France, even though they also have places in England. It it builds up to the French Revolution and all the things that explode in terms of how the sovereignty of the nobility are then viewed. Um, and caught up with this is this repeated reference to the idea of the citizen. Lady Viola Falkland and her friends and family of the higher class keep running into the Butterworth mm. family. The Butterworth, Mr Butterworth, is a cheesemonger mm -hmm. who's done very well. So he is a very emblematic citizen figure. Mm -hmm. um, and his wife, Mrs Butterworth, is the most interesting. So both are described as fat. And they come up in moments of anti-nobility chaos. Mrs Butterworth is really inappropriately trying to assert herself in the higher classes so she wants to become part of Lady Viola's circle mm -hmm. and takes advantage of the chance meeting with Lady Viola um, and she's just essentially this grotesque melting sweating woman who physically is like fitting herself or trying to fit herself into conversations mm -hmm. and obviously from that initial reading you're thinking people should adhere to their rank and mm -hmm. that's it um, whereas actually, interestingly, by the end of the narrative, Mrs. Butterworth's daughter is married to a lord. So actually, for all her uncouth, very ill-educated attempts to ingratiate herself in the higher ranks, she actually does in the end. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting like a way, a lens in which to sort of look at social mobility. Mm -hmm. One other genre I look at is um, illustrated works um, that look at the costume of both England and Yorkshire. Picturesque representations of the dress and manners of the English is a great work for me to consult because essentially all the women depicted in this illustrated work are labouring class except mm -hmm. for one um, image which is titled A Lady in Summer Dress and it's a really bizarre contrast of this gentry woman, very slender, and then all these labouring class women around her are very like thickly set more so than just oh they've exercised the relative size is very noticeable um, and then I pair that with uh, the costumes of Yorkshire mm -hmm. both from 1814 so in the background of the lady in summer dress there is a small bathing machine um, and then there's actually a plate of bathing in the costumes of Yorkshire and what I found interesting about pairing those two is cold bathing or sea bathing was used as a treatment to sort of counteract overindulgence or corpulence. But what doesn't make sense is the lady in summer dress, slender and near the bathing house, and then in the costumes of Yorkshire, the women helping the bathers are again really large mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. in contrast to the majority of the bathers who are mm -hmm. slender. Mm -hmm. Is this about um, the ideas of classical and vulgar body mm. rather than what the physicality of these women were at all but just visually it's just a, mm. a good comparison just to show that corpulence really doesn't necessarily comment on the um literal lived mm -hmm. experience it's always mm -hmm. emblematic of like mm. different themes Hi, my name is Dr. Spina Akram and I am an ethics lecturer at ARU College and an associate lecturer in English Literature at 
um, Open University. Yeah. So my PhD was focused on Robert Southey um, and his last published book, The Doctor and Company, and mm-hmm. I was arguing it was actually an early postmodern piece. Um, uh, but generally, I like to research the 18th and 19th century um, in relation to culture mm-hmm. and women writers of the period, particularly Jane Austen. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've been researching specifically while you've been at Chaucer? Mm-hmm. I have been researching the appeal and adaptability of Jane Austen in mm-hmm. South Asian contemporary fiction, such as Sonia Kumar's Unmarriageable. Mm-hmm. And looking specifically at the colonisation that manifests itself within the plot, the themes such as education, marriage and family. Mm -hmm. So are you thinking about why Austen's novels are kind of enduringly popular Mm -hmm. in a South Asian context? Um, More so than somebody like Kamara Edgeworth or Charlotte Bronte Mm -hmm. or uh, Fanny Burney. Mm -hmm. Um, Why is it Austen appeals so much more to the South Asian Mm -hmm. culture in comparison to any of the other writers? Mm -hmm. What is it about Austen that they like? Mm-hmm. And um, it's probably a big question, mm. but do you have ideas about how to answer that question? Yes, so um, at the moment I'm still fairly um, early on in the research, mm-hmm. but some of the things I've identified thanks to the library here, um, education was, was something that stood out. You had the Macaulay Minute on education in 1835 mm-hmm. when Macaulay said, um, said to the House of Commons that he would like to institutionalise the English language into the Indian education system mm-hmm. over in India. So from 1835 onwards, you had these uh, universities in Bombay, Calcutta and Madras. Um, well, in 1857, they were, they were set up. Mm-hmm. But what they did was they specifically taught English books. So you had Shakespeare, mm-hmm. you had Wordsworth, you had Coleridge. Mm-hmm. But what they then did was take away the Indian heritage and the, Indian, the study of Indian books. Mm-hmm. So what you had was Indian students who were learning a lot about stuff like Austin and Shakespeare Mm -hmm. um, and it slowly started trickling into the culture um, whereas their own cultural heritage was um, something they were not identifying with as Mm -hmm. much and you see a lot of that in these adaptations like Unmarriageable where Kamal talks about the the protagonist which is Alice Binnart who is the Elizabeth Bennet Mm. is an English literature teacher working in a British school in Pakistan and over and over and over again, she talks about how she is trying to re-establish the canon and trying to get South Asians writers into the canon mm-hmm. um, alongside English and American authors. Mm. So there's now this this sort of quite interesting of South Asian writers kind of responding back to yes. Austin. Yes, Austin being known as quintessentially mm. um, English. South Asians identify with what was going on in her novels. So you've got the marriage aspect, you've got women who are actively looking for men to marry who mm. um, to get this social status and to be financially well off you've got mm. the character of Mrs Bennett who I'm sure many South Asians will identify as their mother <laughs> because she's trying to marry you off to to um, give you financial security and that's the same thing that was happening mm. in something like Pride and Prejudice um, but yeah South Asians respond really well to Austin and love Austin mm. but these adaptations what they're doing is taking Austin but they're taking her uh, plots and her themes as much mm-hmm. as they love them, but reclaiming some of what they lost during colonisation mm-hmm. by putting it into the into the books. And that's mm-hmm. the thing I find really interesting and like to explore further. Mm-hmm. So what have you been looking at while you've been in the library? So a couple of texts that really stood out to me in my time here was uh, Murray Graham's Journal of Residence in India. Mm-hmm. Eliza Fay's um, Letters from India and Niall Green's uh, the Love of Strangers, um, mm-hmm. where this book in particular, Nile Greens, it's, it depicts a journal that an Iranian student um, wrote when he was in England in 1815. Mm-hmm. And he's telling you about the culture of England, and um, which is very similar to his Iranian culture in some ways. Mm-hmm. So, so these three books that I've been looking at, Graham and Faye, and the book that Green's written, mm-hmm. this was all taking place in the early 1800s. So you've got between a time span of 1808 to 1815. Mm. And this was before the, the height of colonisation, which came later. But one thing I found really interesting in Graham and Fay in particular mm. was the way that they depicted Indian culture when they went over to India, which is completely different to how South Asians would say now, because we would say it's quite similar to um, 19th century, 18th century English culture because mm. of the comparisons we can make to Austen and the the social climbing the marriage etc etc but graham and Fay describe an india which is barbaric which is completely different Mm. to what 
they have experienced. So that was really interesting because what that really does is strengthen my argument that colonisation actually played a part in changing some of the culture mm. um, later on in India, if what we are if we are to believe what Graham and Faye are mm-hmm. saying. Mm-hmm. But also, I suppose it, it shows a kind of um, a tendency to sort of retrospectively map back on those kind of cultural resonances yeah. that actually at the time um, were very much not perceived yeah. by people travelling at least. Although there's an interesting kind of reversal there um, between, you know, the, the Faye and the Mariah Graham um, as English women yes. going to yeah. going to to India. Uh, to, yeah. um, and then there's a reversal, right, yeah. um, with the Iranian and the student. the really, really interesting thing with the, with the reversal is the Iranian student doesn't see this thing that right. uh, Graham and Faye are, are seeing. They, although there are some cultural clashes, mm. um, what the Iranian student and the other five that have come over to to London with him mm. are, are seeing is they are actually trying to immerse themselves into the English culture, mm. and they are trying to find these similarities. And um, instead of creating a barrier, they want to bring some of their heritage and mm. meet with the English halfway and create, if you like, what Niall Green is arguing, the multicultural England that we now exist in. Mm. Whereas with Graham and Faye, they don't seem to go beyond that. They do, they mm. don't seem to see anything other than um, this really different India mm. that's so far from what they from what their culture is back home. They describe India as some parts they say are very beautiful, the landscape, but this generally is the part that the colonization has happened in, mm. or that the or I suppose the because colonization hasn't happened to the extent it had would do later on, mm. but where the British are. So they always say that the British aspect of where they're living is great. And she actually describes um um Faye describes an area of India as being the black town where the natives are. Mm. So yeah, in terms of the landscape, um the yeah, there's a there's a there's a big difference in in how they're describing mm. where the natives are and where they're living, and even going so far to use what I would consider racist language mm. now, mm. Um, but particularly the, uh, in Graham's um, uh, journal of residence in India, she makes a distinction between the Muslims and the Hindus. So um, around this time, you obviously have um, a lot of distrust towards Islam and uh, Muslims. So she makes that distinction, and even though she is um talking about india itself being really different she still has levels where the hindus are slightly um stronger if you like slightly better in their cultural Mm -hmm. manner manners than the muslims according to her so uh, i think a lot of the time the feminist recovery project would sort of hail someone like mariah graham as you know this pioneering woman who goes out but of course there's also um a, a kind of you know, what happens when we actually look at her works and how do mm-hmm. we deal with works by women writers of this time which which do hold views which are now um, yeah. unacceptable? That's a very interesting uh, point and something I actually would like to, being in my time here, I was thinking, explore further, mm. especially with these travel journals with mm. like Faye and um, with Graham, that, you know, on the one hand you have these, these fantastic women who um, are considered feminists and, you know, pioneering, but on the other hand, when you actually read their work and what they're saying about some of these um, cultural, um, the cultures or the religions or these people, um, it is racist. There's mm. no there's no other way of, of putting mm. it. You know, she describes somebody, um, she's, she's talking about a Hindu and a Muslim, and she's one of the lines says, he was a Muslim and therefore a great bigot. So it's it's very yeah it's 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 tricky one but yeah. at the same time I think more research needs to be done on these travel writings mm-hmm. because what they're writing is clearly their view on something it's not the view that we'll take now and mm. perhaps not the view that it might have been there mm. they're not like, necessarily kind of representative yes. yeah. I'm Dr Alison Daniel and I work at Southampton University and I also am a, an honorary research associate at UCL and my research basically is um, focused around marriage, specifically um, the doctrine of coverture and how this is explored and represented in women's fiction, so that's novels written by women um, of the long 18th century. And so what have you been doing uh, over these last few weeks while you've been at Chawton? What have you been well, looking at? Well, I mean, the, the collection at Chawton came is just amazing. <laughs> 
and I have been able to access all sorts of novels um, which I cannot and could not get hold of anywhere else. Um, so in particular, I have been looking at some of Amelia Opie's work mm -hmm. and I've also been able to access some novels by Charlotte Smith as well, which has just been tremendous for my research. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, I have been able to look at some Acts of Parliament um, for divorce because that was the only way in which you could dissolve a marriage before just about the middle of the 19th century mm -hmm. and also some publications relating to the divorce process which were sold as kind of sort of salacious um, popular um, editions that mm -hmm. the, the public couldn't get enough of so I've had a look at some of those as well. So these public um, accounts was this something that was happening quite often do you mean the divorce? The divorce yeah. No, and divorce didn't happen an awful lot. Mm -hmm. I think it, it rose as the 18th century continued, mm -hmm. but it sort of rose from about two divorces a year to about three point something divorces per year. Okay. So it wasn't it wasn't a huge amount. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, the only cause that you could get a divorce for, a divorce that properly dissolved your marriage and that allowed you to then remarry, was adultery. And it was really only men who were allowed to pursue this course. And you mm -hmm. had to do it by way of Act of Parliament. Mm -hmm. And before the Matrimonial Causes Act comes in in um, the 1850s, which allows men as well, well women as well as men to petition for divorce mm -hmm. only four women um were able to get a divorce by way of act of parliament so it was quite restrictive and it's quite gender specific as well mm -hmm. i was looking at some 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 general divorce petitions so there was one mm -hmm. done by a doctor which is which is in itself quite interesting because a lot of people think that um parliamentary divorce was only available to the aristocracy because mm -hmm. it was quite expensive but the research has suggested that um, people of the professional or the artisanal classes were able to afford it and were were able to to mm -hmm. access it so there was a divorce by a doctor and um there was another divorce of somebody who was a little higher up the social mm -hmm. scale mm -hmm. as well with a divorce then the act of parliament is the very kind of final stage of the divorce That's the but there final are stage. earlier stages too, there are there? earlier stages yes mm -hmm. you could i mean the, the the english legal system has always had ways in which people can sort out unhappy marriages and can can seek to regulate them and potentially bring them de facto to an end even mm -hmm. if they couldn't dissolve the bond of marriage and um, the first step was to get a divorce in the church courts and this was known as a divorce at Mensa at Toro mm -hmm. which is literally from table and hearth and this was more like a judicial separation so this didn't actually mean that you could go and marry somebody else but it meant mm -hmm. that you were relieved of the duties of marriage so you didn't have to cohabit with your spouse and there could be arrangements made for alimony or maintenance as we, we call it these days mm -hmm. and women could petition for those there was no problem with, with women going to the court and asking for one of those because women had rights of audience in the church courts. It's only in really in common law courts that women couldn't mm -hmm. couldn't do that. So your first step was to establish your, your cause of action and you could go and get your church court divorced. Following that, if you were a man, what you needed to do was to pursue an action for criminal conversation against your wife's lover. Now, this basically... Um, sets the wife up as the husband's property and what the husband is doing is he is claiming damages under common law for for infringement of his property right yeah so yeah not not particularly enlightened and mm. the woman was not allowed to have even though she was named as part of the proceedings um she had no part in the proceedings she wasn't a party to the action and she couldn't speak or give any evidence at mm, all mm. and this is of course um where mary wollstonecraft um subverts the whole court process mm. at the end of maria where she has maria write a letter to the judge which is mm -hmm. which mm. is is read out mm. and so you say that she was probably reading some of those cases. she was probably reading i think the research has been done to show that mm. the um details of crim con cases mm. were published mm. and were you know Know, devoured voraciously by the public who like that sort of salacious detail and as I understand it there were some of these publications were in William Godwin's library and the supposition is that um, she could have accessed it. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this really interesting translation then from the real world through the kind of um, legal courts and then into fiction as well. So you were looking at Amelia Opie for example yes. and what what do you think Amelia Opie uh, has to say about coverture? Um Amelia Roby has an awful lot to say about marriage and one of the things about my research is that I would like people to realise how much a part of marriage, how much 
the, the package of matrimony coverture was. But what Amelia Opie's novels do brilliantly is that they dissect the various strands of marriage. The 18th century, like a lot of periods in the past, had an ongoing debate about what marriage was. Mm. What, what does it mean to be married? What is the most important aspect of a marriage is mm -hmm. it the relationship between the parties is it you know the love match essentially mm -hmm. is it the church ceremony mm -hmm. is it the civil bond that's formed or is it the economic transaction mm -hmm. that occurs on marriage mm -hmm. and what Opie's books do absolutely brilliantly is that they look at each of these and they analyse them and they dissect mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So for example in Adeline Mowbray you have um, a heroine who does not get married but is protesting the kind of supremacy of the emotional bond that she has with her partner and that, I mean that just so revolutionary. Mm. Also a kind of libertine argument going back. Yeah. Donkey's yeah. years, right? And, and although it eventually, because of the morality of the times, it sort of has to fall flat on its face. Mm -hmm. It's an important exploration of this idea of the effective marriage and what that means. Mm -hmm. And can the effective marriage or can the effective relationship between the parties, um, can that be treated as, if you like, the, the dominant mm. idea within the wider idea of matrimony? And Opie says no mm. at that point, that you have to have other other strands. So a focus on the different aspects of marriage. Yes. Each, each one of those focuses kind of carries with it um, certain kind of classed or um, political yes. um, weight, I guess. Um, yes. Which an OP, I, I think, is really interesting because she's quite difficult to pin down politically. Yes. I think um, you know, there's the kind of radicalism of Wollstonecraft and and, and Godwin, um, but also what happened subsequently. You know, um, after Wollstonecraft died, and OP, yes. I think, is someone who's lived through that and who's seen um, the kind of um, yeah, the implications of um, that sort of radical thinking when it's applied to actual real life scenarios. Yes, yes, she, she's she's very well aware of what the real life situation is and the fact that you can't live out abstract political ideals yeah. within um, within the cultural norms of the society that Particularly existed. Particularly if you're a woman. Particularly um, yeah. if you're a woman, yeah. absolutely. Mm. So that's really interesting. And the other thing about Opie um, and the way in which she's looking at marriage is I found... Um, an affinity between how she dissects marriage and how um, Bernie also talks about it in The Wanderer because mm. you have this idea of the woman who is a wife but she's not quite a wife and if she is a wife she was only married in a civil ceremony and does that really count and what what is a marriage and what should a marriage be? Mm. So the pair of them are really dealing with similar issues. Mm. Can you say a little bit um, about what it was like being a visiting fellow uh, over these last few weeks? Oh, it was a real challenge. No, um, it was a one. No. <laughs> Awful, um, I know dreadful. There's been, like sort of an endurance test. Um, <laughs> so I've never been on a fellowship before, so I have no um, like standard to compare it to. But I genuinely um, think that being on site actually really focuses, and it meant that just I mean, like not even just the practicalities of taking out. Um, journey time etc but there's something about um, you can't help but be really excited because you're in the environs of Chawton House um, and you're sort of living breathing or at least walking the stairways of what perhaps once were the people you're consulting the works or once did. It's a great opportunity as well that there's more than one of you so you're constantly sort of of an evening or in the morning being like what are you going to be looking at what have you been consulting and you sort of have those sort of light bulb moments because you're with your peers and I think the fact that people such as yourself and like the rest of the staff have such a vested interest in the collections and sort of live and breathe it themselves so I mean even Katie the CEO who say that she's not academic at all has like <laughs> run the exhibit on botanical women um, so it's not just sort of coming to a place where people sort of see you as a set in a separate room and then leave you to it and that's that like actually everyone's like oh what's this and you kind of yeah and, and people identify um bits of, like that you'd like to look at for your own research and their work and vice versa it's like a mm. bit of a pass off so yeah mm. sad sad to not be <laughs> living here forever yeah, it's been an absolute great experience and you know <laughs> I, it's been an opportunity that that i didn't think i would ever get and i 
just can't put into words just how amazing it is like the collection here the Chawton House Library the resources I've been using to be able to have that at your disposal for a month it's amazing and the, and the staff that work here the volunteers it really is like a family and I felt so welcomed by every single one the fact that it's targeted at postgraduates and early career researchers I think is amazing and I would recommend any postgraduates and ECRs to apply because it's a fantastic opportunity well just working in Chawton is amazing I don't know if you can see the books behind us <laughs> but um, I've spent a month in a room just lined with the most fabulous books um, there are novels and primary resources here that you just couldn't get anywhere else but it's backed up by a tremendous collection of good scholarly secondary sources as well so you can contextualize everything you can get hold of the secondary material that you need um, there are a superb range of primary sources here some there's things like manuscript novels there are um, historical sources like the divorce acts that i've been able to consult here there's letters there's journals there is just so much there is so much to look at um, and also as a lifelong Jane Austen fan <laughs> to have had a month living and working in a house that um, Austen knew and was familiar with and also potentially handling books from the night collection that Austen herself may well have read mm. is has just been it's been life transforming <laughs> so.